I'm sorry. I think my neighbors have moved out. I've been gone for a week and their dresser is gone. <laughs> It's Natalie, also known as Nitty Natty. Welcome to episode 171 of the Love in Stitches podcast. Today is Wednesday, March 8th, and it's a beautiful sunny day here in New York City. We're still hanging on to winter. It's like 30 degrees outside, so I'm wearing my sweater, although I'm already kind of getting a little bit warm in here. Uh, let me just show you this real quick, though. This is the Long Summer Cardigan by Hohi Locatelli. It's really, really long. <laughs> I knit it in Moon Glow Yarn Co's, um, I can't remember the gray color, but I'll have the project linked. And the pinks fade ever so slightly down and they are the Love and Stitches fade set. I've been wearing this a lot over the last week because it's my favorite thing to wear to travel. Actually, I'm wearing my entire travel outfit, white t-shirt, long summer cardigan, stretchy joggers. <laughs> I just decided to be travel comfy today, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm wearing and the project page will be down below. How the heck are ya? <laughs> that's my uh, Elise Myers um, interpretation, I guess. If you don't know who Elise Myers is, she is so funny. She's on Instagram and TikTok and you should definitely go and follow her. She's a comedian and tells really funny stories, but she always says that. So it's been two weeks and I already feel like I'm rusty on the podcast, which is crazy how that happens. But I've had lots of videos come out over the last couple of weeks that I can't wait to share with you later. In this episode, I am going to be announcing the winners from episode 170. So stay tuned. That will be in the news segment. Um, I also have a big FO to share with you. You've probably already seen it, but I haven't gotten to share it yet here on the podcast. And uh, thank you for your dry shampoo suggestions from the last episode. I am thinking about what I want to do with that. So I think we better just uh, carry on to the projects because we have so much to talk about today. I just realized the word I wanted to use a few moments ago was impersonation, not interpretation. <laughs> Let me get my brain fired up. Okay, so let's talk about my FO for the week. This project here was my focus project for February. I was working on it every single day, just about, and I wanted to finish it within the month. And that is my scrappy granny square blanket. I have so much to tell you about this. So if you don't already have a cup of tea or something, you might want to get one. <laughs> it's going to be a long episode. Um, but she is done. Oh my gosh, it feels super, super soft. So let me back up and just talk about how this project started five years ago, um, four or five years ago. It started with Advent. I think it was 2019. 2019, 2020, 2021, 2018. It had to be 2018 because for four years, I um, purchased the uh, Dragon Horde Yarn and Yarn Cafe Creations Yarn Advent Calendar, which came with 24 mini skeins. And every single day in December from the 1st to the 25th, I would pull out a mini skein, crochet myself a square, set it aside, weave in the ends, started doing that I think in the second year, and um, set it aside. And for a long time, Hey, stop calling me. <laughs> I'm getting so many spam calls lately. Um, for those four years, I had total plans to make a blanket. I just didn't really like feel ready to do it yet. I didn't really know how, first of all, and I didn't have enough squares. So what was the point of even starting on that? I wanted to have all my squares before I actually began to assemble. Last year, I didn't make any new squares. I didn't even try to assemble. I just totally took a break from Granny Square Land and worked on other Advent projects. So at the beginning of this year, I declared this is a scrap-free 2023. And I'm saying scrap-free 2023 because it's really catchy and great. And I do have lots of leftover yarns, but I also have mini skeins and projects I had already started that are part of like Advent sets, etc. So let's not get into semantics here. To me, it's an umbrella term. <laughs> Anything that's not like a 100 gram skein of yarn is gonna be in scrap-free 2023 for my terms. 
So this was one of the projects that was already started but needed to be complete. So I had stacks and stacks of squares. I think I had over 100 squares and I ended up using 96 of them here in the blanket. And I'm so proud of how it came out. If you wanna see like the entire journey, I did film um, from the day I got all my squares out and arranged them to the day I did the border, including everything in between, all the mistakes that I made, all the things that I learned. And if you're putting together a granny square blanket or just like enjoy that type of video format, I think you'll really like um, the vlog that I put out on that. Okay, so let's talk about the yarns that I used to put it together and how much I used. I actually need to pull up my project page for this. I'm trying really, really hard to keep my um, newest project pages like with the best notes possible because it doesn't, I know it helps me <laughs> if I ever go back, I'm not saying I'm gonna do something like this again anytime soon, but if I ever do go back to rework a project, it really helps me personally if I have good notes. And then I know that it helps me when I'm looking to start another project, if somebody has um, put notes on their pattern or on their project page. So I do these notes for me and for all of you. So hopefully it answers lots of questions about the pattern. But if you have one still, um, just ask on the on Ravelry, leave a comment, and then I try to go back and add it into like the details on the project page. Okay, so I'm pulling up my project page here because off the top of my head, I don't remember how much yarn I use for each thing, but I do have it here. So for my joining yarn, I used one of my favorite neutral colors from Moon Glow Yarn Company. <laughs> You can see it there. Oh, and the joining method I used is called the um, continuous join as you go. You work like across a row and then you kind of just like keep going like this and you don't ever have to cut your yarn. It's the best. The tutorial I used is gonna be linked down below uh, for today since I'm talking about this project, but after that, if you need to find it, it's in the project page. So back to the yarn, Moon Glow. Yarn Company, and I used the 7525 Superwash Merino Nylon Base because I knew that would be really good for blankets. And this color is called Cottonwood Breeze. So I had 96 squares. I haven't taken a measurement of the total blanket yet. I definitely need to do that. Um, it's not a huge blanket. It's like a good couch blanket. It's a little bit bigger, I'd say, than lap size, but maybe maybe it is lap size. It's not like lay all the way down in bed type of blanket like my other granny's granny stripe one, um, but this one is a really good size and I'm happy with how it came out. It's a nice lightweight blanket, but I estimated that I would need around 220 total grams. Then I added some extra for insurance and I ended up buying three total skeins of yarn. However, I did not need that much. In fact, it's my bag. I finished this project and then I went right out of town. So everything's still a, like a little bit messy here. I still have a whole third skein untouched and this is what's left of the second ball of yarn so I think this one is hmm I wrote it down here that I used 170 grams or 787 yards so this must be about 30 grams remaining so what that did is it joined all the squares together and then it also did one granny uh, round around the entire blanket. So you can see like here, oh, that's not, let's show a different color. Okay, so here on this purple square, you can see it's got two layers of that neutral color because I did one around as I joined and then I did one entire uh, round around, um, I'm sorry, I think my neighbors have moved out. I've been gone for a week and their dresser is gone. <laughs> Every week I sit here in my podcast in the same spot and I can look up into my neighbor's apartment. I mean, I can see like the corner of their apartment and they're gone, I think. We didn't know each other, but they will be missed. Okay, back to this. <laughs> so I, the reason I did one entire round around the entire blanket with that neutral color, it wasn't planned. I thought I would go immediately into my pink border color, but when I watched through a different tutorial, also by the same person um, that did the joining tutorial, her name is Hooked by Robin, best tutorials for crochet. Um, she said that as you do your first round, it's best to use the same color that you joined everything with. That's because you do some decreases. So it's gonna be a little hard to tell here. 
yeah, I think you can see this right here is a decrease as I go from one corner, one uh, corner of this square to the corner of this square, I needed to do a decrease. And that's so that your border doesn't have too many stitches and get all wavy and wobbly. I think this worked out perfectly. So after I did that one round with the neutral color, I switched to my border color. This was also a Moon Glow um, Yarn Company, same base, in the color Wild Orchid. I love this color. It's very much, I think it's like one of these in my, um, in my sweater here, maybe this one, very, very similar. Um, but I thought it just needed something on the border of this blanket, just, just a small outline, a small, not even like a big frame, just a little outline. I only did three rows of this border. So the border in total, I would say is four rows because it's one of the neutral color and then three of the pink. I did not know how much I was gonna need for this. I thought two skeins would be sufficient and um, Whitney who is the dyer sent me three skeins where's my other one here we go she sent me three skeins and look I didn't even need these second two so now I have this beautiful color that maybe I can do something lovely with later on um, I haven't even taken the time to like rewind this I'll probably re-cake this with my winder because there's still a lot left let's see project page Natalie how much did I use um, it looks like I used only 46 grams or about 213 yards and that was with three rounds around the blanket and I really really like how it turned out so hopefully I've answered any questions about it about this blanket there is so many details there are so many details in the project page um, along with the links to the tutorial I used to join the squares and the tutorial I used for the border, the one that told me I needed to do those decreases and all of that. So let me back up here and see if I can hold this up and then we're gonna talk about what happened. <laughs> we're gonna talk about what happened to this blanket. The journey is not over yet. Okay, of course I won't be able to show it all, but it is eight squares wide. So see, it's not super duper huge. Eight squares wide and it is 12 squares tall tall so it's pretty tall I'm five foot six and when I sit down on the couch I always have my legs up because it's way more comfortable right and it totally covers my feet my legs and then kind of like pulls a little in my lap so a perfect size I think for hanging out on the couch I'm calling it a couch blanket because I think it's a little bigger than a lap blanket. I don't know why, but to me, a lap blanket is like, just covers you if you're sitting like cross-legged or in a chair. I don't know why. <laughs> That's my interpretation of it and I'm sticking to it. Okay, so the last thing, I have to give a huge PSA to anyone that ever does a granny square. I also feel like um, because this scrappy granny, I have a tutorial on how to do a granny square. I feel like, am I showing you the back? Um, wait, what? Hold on. Don't worry about it. Sometimes I still can't tell the front and back of crochet. I know it's like so obvious, but it's not as obvious to me <laughs> as, it, as it is in knitting or anything like that. I'm still learning. But I did not know this, that if you start a granny square or anything with a magic ring, which is one of my favorite ways to start, it's so beautifully circular. Look at that. Look at it. Look how nice it is in the center there. So nice. If you do that, you need to either weave in your end very, very, very well, or just don't do the magic ring and do something sturdier. Because if you basically do anything with this, I washed mine in the machine, by the way, everything went great as far as like the yarn itself goes, but the granny squares, about five of them came undone in the middle, the magic ring, just worked its way out. I started losing stitches and about 10 more like loosened up where the magic ring like expanded and it was about to come undone, but I was able to fix it. So if you wanna see the fix on how I did that, because after I shared, so many people said to me that either that's why they don't do magic ring or that's happened to them recently or it's happened to them now and they wanted to see how to fix it. So I just feel like I can't not say anything now about magic ring. Everyone needs to know this if you're crocheting. 
magic ring needs to be reinforced or you can do something else. So let's talk through those things. Oh, but actually first I want to say where you can find where I showed how I fix things. So in my big vlog on this blanket, I showed how I tightened um, the all of the ones that came loose. I didn't really show one like a repair, but then I recorded a short video, which if you didn't know, I am now putting um, short videos here on YouTube. They're going to also be on Instagram. So wherever you want to like watch and consume the short form content, I feel like it's such a good way to share something like that is small like that, that's really quick and easy to find. Last year I was putting tutorials into my podcast, but then I always get questions about, hey, where can I find those tutorials? And they're not easy to find, right? So I'm thinking about putting more tutorial, like short 60 second stuff in YouTube shorts so that it's very easy and searchable to find. Okay, so let me know what you think about that too. But I did put my repair for the magic ring into a YouTube short so you can find it here on the YouTube channel if you look if you like search magic ring and nitty natty or if you um, look under my scrap free 2023 playlist it should all be right there um, that's where I show like specifically I give a tutorial in, in 60 seconds on how I fixed everything so let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about what happens next time I do a uh, a granny square. So if you're going to do a magic ring, I still think that that's okay. You just will want to leave your tail like long. So all I did on mine is <laughs> I, I believe, I don't know, remember I finished these like two years ago, so I can't remember exactly what I did. But once I did my magic ring and I had a tail, I think I crocheted over the end and then I think I went one more time around the circle in the middle, but actually I'm not even positive that I did that. You know what? It's making me, it's making me warm just talking about it. I gotta take this off. <laughs> See, that's the nice thing about cardigans. You can just shed a layer when you're feeling heated. Um, so I don't even know, I, I can't even say that like magic ring is like not gonna work because I feel like I did a really bad job of weaving in my ends. So if I were to do this again and I did do a regular old magic ring, let's get something that's a little easier to see. I would then go from the center. See, there here's the center four clusters. I would then go from the center. I would go around the center. Then I would move up to the next layer of clusters. I would go around, like go through a few of them and then I'd come up and then I'd go the opposite way, like zigzag through quite a few layers and rows of the granny square. I feel like that will be so much more secure. And as long as you do it for a couple of inches, I think you're gonna be okay. However, let's do something even sturdier, okay? There is something called a double magic ring. I haven't done it yet and I haven't looked it up, but lots of you said it's great and swear by it. To my knowledge, I think it's basically more strands of yarn, like through the ring. So my suggestion or what I plan to do next time is one, learn how to do the double magic ring. And then I will also weave in my ends really, really well, coming up through different layers, zigzagging, etc. You can also do the classic method, I think something that's really sturdy. I just don't know for me personally if I like how it looks enough is the like where you chain three or four and then connect them in a ring. And then of course still weave in your end well, but at least it's going to be connected structurally um, with that ring and it's not gonna come undone. So those were a few of the options. And then several people have also said to me that I might wanna take some sewing thread and go through and reinforce all of the centers here, but Remember how I said there's 96 squares? I don't really wanna do that. <laughs> if I need to, I will. I'm gonna keep an eye on this blanket. It's not going in the washing machine again. I think I can handle um, hand washing this because it's not so huge, but um, yeah. I'm so proud of this blanket. When I finished it, it was kind of a time crunch because I was doing well on my goal of finishing it by the end of February, but I was going out of town a few days before the end of February. So I really wanted to have it finished. I wanted to have it washed, which was to me like totally finished. I wanted to finish creating the vlog about it, getting that edited and ready to show. And so I was in a little bit of a rush at the end. I had finished um, the border, but then I was um, wanting to throw it in the washing machine. And we were getting ready to go meet some friends, to have some lunch. 
And so I was like, okay, perfect. The washing machine will end literally right on time. I'll lay this blanket out and then we'll go to lunch. <laughs> and of course, that's when I discovered all of the holes in my blanket. So I repaired them and then the next day we went out of town. So I feel like this blanket, it didn't end where I wanted it to be. It didn't end how I expected it to be. And it made me feel like certain emotions towards the blanket because it was such a happy experience all throughout joining it, all throughout creating the squares. And then it was like, man, this little thing at the end kind of ruined it, even though I repaired things. So I'm curious if you feel the same way about your like handmade things sometimes that they make you feel a certain way that you didn't even think you could feel those emotions about something that's inanimate. <laughs> but it's a project that you put a lot of time into. I don't know. So now that I've been away for about a week, not looking at this blanket, not thinking about this blanket, I'm starting to get the good, happy feelings that I had while creating it again. So I'm proud of it. I I'm so excited that it's done. I think I'll start, maybe I'll even move it. Um, I need to get a good like finished object picture of it, but maybe I'll even move it to the couch and start using it and try to try to repair my relationship with the blanket a little bit. I realized I didn't really show the border that well, so it's just a nice thin border. Oh, and we probably have a picture of this all finished laid out on the bed. So I'll put it right here and we'll also have the video for you, one of these sides, so you can go watch that if you haven't seen it already. Next project. Okay, so this is a project that I have been spending the most time in over the last two weeks. So remember, it's been two weeks. So this looks a little different. And that is my Citrine Light, which is a sweater by Emily Green. It's a beautiful pullover sweater. I think it's just a really classic, like simple sweater, but it has so many fine details that are just coming out so nicely. And you may notice, wow, Natalie, it looks so lovely and drapey. How did you achieve that? Well, I have just pulled this off the blocking mats. <laughs> I am a big proponent now, recently, not always, of stopping and blocking your sweaters mid-project. I got this idea from my knitting friend, Beth. So thank you, Beth. It was a couple of years ago. I, um, I think it was Rhinebeck 2021. Does that make sense? I think that's true. <laughs> I think that's true. But I was making a colorwork sweater. It was a yoked sweater. And I just wasn't feeling confident about how it was going to fit me. And I was just, you know, it was making me not want to work on the project because I wasn't sure it was going to fit. So then you automatically like don't want to put effort into working on something when you're unsure about it. And so that was when Beth suggested to me that why don't you just put it on some yarn and block it <laughs> and then you can try it on. And that ended up being perfect. I think the blocking part is a big element of that because you can block it and see how it's going to fit you um, after you've completed and blocked it, right? But it was, it's not just the blocking. I think the block, blocking something, and I mean wet blocking, like submerging in water, does so many things to help you understand the fit, but it also gives you a break from a project. And I just, can't tell you how many times I've learned this over the past couple of years, that if something is not going right, if something doesn't feel right in the project, if you're not interested in it, taking a couple days off, intentional, not like feeling guilty because you're not working on it, deciding I'm gonna put this away for 48 hours and then make a decision is monumental and making great knitting choices and crochet choices. So anyway, this project, I blocked mid project for a couple of reasons, but let's talk about the pattern first and then I'll, or like where I'm at in the pattern and then I'll come back to that. So I just put my, my little cute ramen stitch marker from Della Dino um, back on here. But of course I did not have that on there when I blocked it. Can you see me? <laughs> okay, so I did quite a bit on the body and then I was getting bored on the body because it's just the same thing, working round and round and round. Although this does have a really lovely um, twisted rib on the side that I think is really, really fun. But I was getting kind of bored, so I thought, why don't I pick up a sleeve? And if you remember, I was not um, going to do the sleeve as it is written in pattern, as I have 
clearly done now in the twisted rib because I am running short on yarn. This yarn is actually yarn I bought for a totally different sweater project. So I only got four skeins and these are 75 gram skeins. Um, speaking of the yarn, this is Magpie and Spin Cycle. And it is called Dyed in the Skein. It is 75 yard, or 75 grams, 300 yards. And it is called Fior de Latte. That's the colorway name. So I got these skeins originally to knit the Alpen Glow. And then I decided that wasn't gonna work. I ordered a different yarn and I still had these skeins in my stash. I'm like, what am I gonna do with these? And I landed on this sweater by Emily Green. But because I didn't have very much yarn and this yarn is not something that you can just like go to Magpie's site and buy. It is a collaboration between two different like dye companies and it's not something you can just get at any time. So I didn't even really bother trying to find another skein. Instead my solution was let's make this sweater work in a way that I can just use the, the yarn that I have. <laughs> Which is never really the best way to do things because it leads you towards making decisions that you wouldn't make if you had all the all the options available, right? Again, another lesson that I, I am learning this year. So you may be wondering, well then why did you go ahead and do Twisted Rib? So my plan was to do stockinette here on the sleeve so that I could save some of the yarn and actually have a body because this is not, not very long. Um, and somebody, one of you, actually two people reached out to me on Instagram. Um, one person sent me a message several weeks ago and said, hey, I think that Magpie has more of like your colorway just in case you want to get new yarn. And I was like, okay, thank you so much. But I didn't really even look into it because I didn't think the colorway would match my sweater. And with something that's so simple, I figured if it's even like a tiny bit off, it's not going to look good. Well, a few weeks later, somebody else messaged me, hey, I think the Spin Cycle store has your colorway Fiora Latte, if you're looking for another skein, they only have two, you know, send them a message right away. And th by then I had come to my senses <laughs> and I was like, you know what, I am gonna go reach out. So I direct messaged with Spin Cycle and they said, you know what, we, we don't have two skeins anymore. I'm like, that's all right. I think one skein will do it. And <laughs> I got so lucky. Thank you to both of you who messaged me. Uh, both of you played a role in me finally deciding the right choice to order another skein of yarn. So thank you so much. So yeah, I DM'd with Spin Cycle. I ordered one more skein of Fior de Latte, but it's not here yet. It's coming today. I got a message, an email this morning that says out for delivery. So I am kind of in limbo waiting to decide where the skein is going to go in my sweater. So as of right now, I've completed the left sleeve. Oh yeah, so since I have this extra yarn coming, I decided I would have enough for the sleeve. I've completed the left sleeve. I've done like maybe half, mm, uh, yeah, actually probably about half of the body. I probably have a good six or seven inches here. And I have one more skein and then the one that's coming. So these are 75 gram skeins. So this skein will get me through a whole sleeve. And then where is, there's a little bit left. After I did this sleeve, there's a little bit left. I think about, I think I wrote this down. My sleeve used 61 grams, but remember these are 75 gram skeins. So I only have what, <laughs> 14? Does that sound right? 14 grams left. So that will go probably in the body. So I'm waiting until this skein comes in, this new one. I'm gonna wind it up. I'm gonna compare it to the one I already have. And that will help me decide, does the new skein go in the body? Does the new skein go in the other sleeve? That I will know soon. So that's a whole nother reason why I felt like blocking this right now, stopping and blocking would be a really great idea because I needed to kind of stall and like wait out getting this new skein in the mail. Um, before I finish up talking about the blocking part, I want to say one more thing about the sleeve. So when I, once I knew I had that new skein coming in, I stopped and kind of thought about do I, what do I really want my sleeve, my sweater to look like? 
if I had all the yarn I needed, what choice would I make? Would I make a choice to do ribbing, like the pattern says, or would I make a choice to do stockinette to save yarn, save time, whatever. And that really got me out of the place of thinking like in the moment, like oh, I just wanna like finish the sweater and thinking about what do I actually want to wear? What do I actually want it to look like? And that's when I came to the conclusion that I really liked the way the twisted rib sleeve looked. It was gonna be worth the extra effort of knitting twisted rib. It was gonna be worth waiting on that skein of yarn and getting that skein of yarn and purchasing that. And I'm happy right now <laughs> with my choice. If the new skein comes in totally different, which wouldn't be anyone's fault but my own for well, it's really not even my fault. I didn't know I was making the sweater. I probably shouldn't have picked this sweater. It's my fault. Um, I'll make it work somehow though. It's gonna work. So, okay, let's finally get back to <laughs> talking about blocking. So I've had a couple of second guesses on whether I've picked the right size for myself for this sweater. I am knitting a size two for the body and I am knitting a size three for the sleeve. So what that means is I cast on at the top for a size two, I did all the raglan increases for a size two, and then when it said in the pattern, you know, knit to X number of inches for your armhole depth, I switched over to a size up for a size three. I know that, I need that, because I've taken measurements of my arm, I've taken measurements of other sweaters that I like the fit, and I went to the schematics in this pattern and determined I need more space for my sleeves. It's probably something to do with like me being a very small bust, but not a small person. <laughs> so there we go. Um, so I'm really happy I made that decision. It worked out great. So I knit the armhole to the size three. I then picked, uh, followed sleeve instructions for size three because then I had a larger armhole. So I picked up that number of sleeve stitches, um, all of that. And it's coming out great. Um, I wasn't sure though, I, when I tried it on, um, without blocking, it felt, the ribbing felt like stiff in a way. It didn't feel great to wear it. It just felt kind of like bulky and I wasn't sure it was gonna look great. And it was hard to tell. You can see the beautiful detail here on the shoulder. It was hard to tell like how much of that was going to kind of give and stretch over the shoulder because when I tried it on without blocking, this shoulder line was up like right here on my shoulder. But after blocking it, when I tried it on, this has now moved down my shoulder, which then extended my sleeve <laughs> and made it a little bit longer. Um, which I actually kind of like. I've got a picture um, I'll show here of me trying this on post blocking, but I'm gonna be doing an Instagram reel and a, and a YouTube short about before and after blocking. So you'll get to see those like two comparisons, but it just, I knew I was getting that feeling of like, I'm not sure this is working. I knew I needed to take a little break from the sweater. I knew I needed to wait out my yarn. So for all of those reasons, I just figured, let me block it and see how it's fitting. And I left the sleeve um, end open so that if I need, needed to shorten it or add length, it would be easier than finding an end I'd woven in. But now I think it's all good. I think I'm still gonna leave this one open just because you don't really know exactly where everything is gonna fall until you get both sleeves in and both are set like centered on your shoulder. I tried to like center it as I was trying it on, but it's just not the same. So I'm gonna leave that open, but after blocking it, I feel so confident in how the sweater is working out and it makes me want to knit on it more. It, does, it makes me like eager for my new yarn to get here so I can get started on it. And now you'll just have to think of me and hope that with the new skein of yarn, one, it comes in close enough that I can just add it into the sweater seamlessly, two, that I have enough yarn to finish, and three, that I finish this in time <laughs> to wear it before it gets warm. I've got one new project to show you, and this is a very special yarn. So I will come back to the story about the yarn in just a second, but I wound up this skein um, from my stash 
for kind of my like emergency knitting when I went on my trip to Austin last week. I had plenty of projects. I mostly worked on my Citrine Light sweater, but I didn't have like a small project. Well, I did. I'll talk more about that at the end of this episode, but my socks that I brought didn't end up getting worked on. I mostly worked on my sweater, but at the end, when I was flying home, I just really wanted something simple to work on. Again, I was kind of at a crossroads with my sweater. I had finished my sleeve. I didn't really want to knit any more on it till my new yarn came in. I needed a break from it, and I'm really glad I had wound up a skein of yarn, tucked some needles into my bag for a new Musselboro hat. Yes, I've started a Musselboro hat. Um, the other factor in kind of starting this project was that I needed a simple knit. I needed something I could bring around to work on in the dark. We're going to a Broadway show tonight. And I was like, okay, we're getting on the plane. We have a whole day of travel. Why don't I try to get through all the increases and have this hat ready for the show, <laughs> for the Broadway show. And then of course, for anything else I'm doing. So. Here is my newest Musselboro hat. I am making this one for me <laughs> because, I don't know, these are just perfect. I feel like you can have too many, but if you keep making them different, then they're different and you can have as many as you want. Of course you can have as many as you want, but I just am having so much fun with these right now. They're such comfort knitting, they're such perfect take out and about knitting that I just can't stop, won't stop. And I love that they use up most of a skein of yarn. Like I said, this is a special skein and I wanna use as much of it as possible. So whenever I start my Musselboro hats, which by the way, I use a US2 needle. I start with a 32 inch so I can do magic loop for all of the increases because you start here at the top of the hat. I use the crochet pinhole cast on, which I learned from Very Pink Knits, and I have the tutorial linked in the project page. I am thinking about doing one of my own tutorials that kind of shows you how to cast on and then start the first row, because I think that's the most confusing part of this entire hat. The rest is easy, I promise. So if you'd like to see that, let me know. Maybe I can even have it as one of my new YouTube shorts that shows you how to do it like really fast. So <laughs> I start like that. I do all the increases on my 32 inch with magic loop. And then once I'm done increasing, I switch over to um, 16 inch needles. And these are chow goo needles. I really like chow goo for anything smaller than a three. So size two, 16 inch for the majority of the hat. And then when I go and do the other end and I do my decreases, I will um, do the first few rounds of decreases on the 16 inch needle. When my stitches start to get stretched, I switch over to 32 to finish. Now, the pinhole cast on is very much like magic, or magic ring. So on this project, I think it's okay. One, it's not getting as much like um, tension on it as a granny square blanket is gonna get. And I leave a really long tail, I'll kind of weave it in a couple of times, and then I'll leave the tail on the inside because this is a double layer hat. You're never gonna see it, you're never gonna feel it. It's not gonna come undone. You can leave, you know, three inches of tail and it won't come out, it will be fine. So that's why I feel really confident about magic ring in this case. It's called the pinhole cast on, but it's really kind of like a magic ring. So, um, oh, what's different about this muscle bro? I'm glad you asked. So I brought my most recent one. Um, this is a pattern, <clears throat> keep getting a tickle in my throat, I'm sorry. This is a pattern by Isolde Teague that I have made many different times. One day I'll have to pull all of mine together and show all of the different elements of them. My most recent one though has moved into my favorite slot. So the size that I make is somewhere in between, I think adult small and adult medium. I'll put the stitch counts in my project page, but you'll still need the pattern. It's a paid for pattern. It's a great pattern. You'll still need that in order to construct the hat, but I'll just give you my, my stitch counts as markers. And then also I put in there the links that I do for each section. So it's a double layered hat. And the last one that I did, I had stockinette on one crown and for most of like one side of the hat and then one by one rib for the rest. But what I'm finding is that I actually like the way the hat looks the most on the side that has stockinette 
and just rib for the brim. So this is the side that's like all, I think I need to wash this. I wore it a lot. Needs a wash. This is the side that has all rib and it's cute, but the side that is rib and stuck in it is the side that I like best, right? I really like it. So with that knowledge, I am gonna be making this hat with stock in it and just rib in the middle. I also got this idea from somebody, um, one of my, one of the Love and Stitches members did this and I thought it was brilliant and I'm like, wait, why, why didn't I think of it that way? So what she did is she did stockinette all the way here and then just did rib for like six inches in the middle, which would give you a three inch brim on either side. So like here to here, rib, and then the rest of the way, stockinette. So stockinette, imagine stockinette, stockinette, rib in the middle. That way, either way you fold it up, it's stockinette on the head and rib on the brim. Brilliant, saves you from lots and lots of ribbing and also having to figure out the ribbing at the increasing or decreasing parts. So that's what my plan is for this hat. I love the length of this one. I think it's something like 19 inches between the decreases. So it's a little longer so that it has um, a fold up and a little bit of slouch. Cause I don't really love when my hats like go right to my head. I think this is a balance thing for me because I have a small stature from like here up, but I'm not a small person. So I need volume here to like balance things. But I like how this hat looks a lot and I'm planning to make this one the same. So now finally, let's talk about the yarn. <laughs> I told you this is gonna be a long episode. We have just so many knitting things to talk about. So fun. So take a look at this beautiful yarn. This is a special colorway from my friend Brie, who is the Little Wolf Knits. Um, you might have seen her yarn before, but this colorway, oh, by the way, it's 7525, is called Love in Speckles. And it is not a colorway that's available for purchase. Um, we did a dye event with the Love and Stitchers membership this quarter, where we interviewed Brie and she showed us her dye studio and together um, all of my members and Brie, we collaborated on this colorway. And the colorway is inspired by a photo that my members picked that is a New York City sunset. So here's that picture with all the beautiful colors in it. And then this is the colorway that we came up with and they named it Love and Speckles because of Love and Stitches and the speckles in it. So it's got like the blues of the sky, the purples and the grays, a little bit of pink, and of course the coppery colors of the buildings. <clears throat> it's just so cool and so special. This is the only skein of it that I have. So I'm cherishing it into something that, a project that I know that I love and that I will get to see the colors fully, use up as much of the skein as I can, and then of course, wear it a whole lot. So this is a special project, but it's also a very utilitarian project because it's gonna get me through a lot of out and about stuff. Typically for the first podcast of a new month, I will share with you my plan, all of the goals I have for knitting for the month, but I'm not really ready to do that. <laughs> we were out of town when it turned to be March 1st, and we just got back into town on Monday, which was two days ago. Yesterday, we spent all day getting the vlog ready for the from the Knitting in the Hills retreat. And so now it's today, and I feel like I haven't really had time to like sit in the fact that it's a brand new month, even though we are over a week into the month. And you know what, that's okay sometimes. But I do have some general ideas for projects that I'm planning to start this month. I don't think this month is really a finishing month. The only thing I will say is I do wanna finish my Citrine Light Sweater. I have one whole sleeve to do, I have the body to do. I think once that yarn comes in tonight, I'm gonna to be rocking and rolling on that over this weekend. Not saying it will be done by the next podcast episode, but I think I will be like making that my focus to go ahead and finish. It's time to get winter knits done and get those off because I'm ready for spring. <laughs> it's a little bit ironic because the project that I'm about to show you is definitely not a spring knit, but 
It is a dream project. So in the Love and Stitches membership, which I know I'm talking about it a lot this episode, um, but the membership is going to be reopening in April. So if you do want to join the membership, our make-alongs will be different and our events will be different than the ones that I just talked about. But these are the types of things that we do. So I feel like I don't always do a good job of sharing what we do in the membership because I don't want to make people feel um, like they're missing out. And I feel like that can be like rude in a way, but I do want to share with you like the types of things that we do. So if you're interested, you can join us for the next round and things are always changing and things are always getting more and more exciting. So if you want to join us in April, I'll put the link down below for the, um, to get notified via email, but we're doing <laughs> the Love and Stitches membership. And in March, we're doing a dream project make along. And what this is, is, selecting a pattern that you've always wanted to make, whether it's knit or crochet, that you just have been putting off because you know it's, it might be a long-term project or it has something in it that you need to learn. And this is the month that we're gonna cast on. So I have created for all of us a roadmap. You can actually see that right here. Um, again, this is for Love & Stitches members, so it won't be available for download, um, but just to get an idea if you wanna do something like this, so our first week was to select the project. <laughs> our second week, um, which we're in right now, is to choose yarn. Um, and then it just goes from there, like to swatch, um, to like prepare your pattern, and then to finally cast on. I feel like breaking things down in this way, I know works really well for me. So if you wanna use this to kind of get yourself in gear and motivated to do a project that feels intimidating, I think it's a great way to start. So my dream project for several years has been the All of the Lights Cardigan by Hohi Locatelli. So take a look at the picture. Um, it is a beautiful cable cardigan. I know I have talked about it on here. I am pretty sure I've talked about it on Instagram, but I've just always wanted to make this. It's basically like a coat. It's very long, um, very big, and it is a lot of knitting. It's all over cables, but it looks so fun. And I've wanted to make this since the pattern came out. I want to say in like January of 2019 or January of 2020, it's been a few years. So I am thinking about what yarn I want to use to make this project. And when I was at Vogue a couple of weekends ago, a month ago, <laughs> month ago now, I saw um, somebody wearing another cable cardigan and that cable cardigan was knit out of Hedgehog Fibers Tweety. So I had to get myself some Hedgehog Fibers Tweety because it just looked so good in the cables and I have started to swatch. So Tweety is a yarn um, from Hedgehog Fibers. It's a DK weight yarn and it has all these fun colors in it. The colors come from different like scraps and leftovers, I think either from or maybe both from the yarns that they make. And also, I believe you can send them into Hedgehog and they will use them in this yarn, which is really, really cool. Do I have somewhere? I think I have the actual label. Oh, yeah, here it is. OK, so let's look at this Hedgehog Fibers Tweety because it's a really unique yarn. It has 50% Falkland merino wool, 37.5% recycled wool, and 12.5% hedgehog fibers thread waste. There you go, you can take a look. This color, the pink one is called Bliss. Um, there are ooh, maybe five different colors. The gray, the light gray was the one I was first attracted to. And the one I saw at Vogue, I saw the woman wearing her cabled cardigan. And I was like, can I touch the yarn and fill the yarn? And it's a little bit um, wooly. It's got, I don't, I don't know what Falkland merino wool really means, but the recycled wool, I would say, is not a very soft wool. So it's not super soft. It also has, I don't know if you can see, Oh, this is my swatch, by the way. Look out, look at my swatch. I have been taking so many sweater cl classes lately that have been harping on making large swatches. And I think I'm finally turning into, like turning over to that philosophy, like, hey, it's actually worth taking a lot of time to knit a swatch for something that is going to be a long-term project. So 
I'm getting there. <laughs> you don't have to agree with me, but I will tell you all, all the things I'm learning. So it has a lot of like, I don't know if you can see, I think these are guard hairs. Again, I'm not sure if they're really showing off on the camera, but they're like these longer, like white fibers. Um, and so I'm not 100% sure about this yarn. Like when I do this, like it's fine. It really doesn't bother me. I actually did, um, you know, this is my yarn now, so I can do whatever the heck I want with it. It's not like I'm at the yarn store, like stuffing this into my shirt. Um, but I did this for like a little while to like see if it would bother me. This is going to be something more like a coat. So it's not gonna be like a t-shirt where it needs to be directly on my stomach. I find my stomach is very sensitive. My um, like chest area can tend to be a little more sensitive to yarns. So I'm trying to decide like, is this too itchy? Because I don't wanna make something that I don't feel comfortable um, wearing. I also want it to look really, really nice in the cables. So I thought before I go and order nine skeins of this yarn, which is, it's it's not a cheap yarn. I don't know exactly how much it costs. It's, it's a hand dyed yarn. So of course it's gonna be a little more expensive and I'm okay with that, um, but I'm okay with that. That sounded really like haughty, didn't it? That's not what I meant. I'm okay with it in the sense that I see the value in the yarn. I understand how much work it takes. And I think the price is fair. I just know that I don't want to invest that much money into something until I try it myself. Okay, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. But because of that, I decided that it would be worth the time and the money to buy a single ball of yarn and swatch it up and see what I thought. So when I was at, um, when I was at, Hill Country Weavers, they had this yarn and I thought, perfect, let me grab a skein, let me start playing with it, let me start swatching with it. And that's where I started doing my um, swatch. I learned right away that I already needed to go down a needle size from what the pattern says, which is pretty typical, but I'm gonna do a little more stockinette and then I'm gonna switch over to cables because the biggest thing for me is I want the cables to look good in the yarn. I want them to stand out, I want them to pop, and my fear is that this yarn is a little thin. It is a DK, but it's not like a heavy DK yarn. I think it looks nice in the stockinette, like that's a nice fabric. It's not too see-through, it's sturdy, um, but I gotta make sure it looks good in the cables because this is a cabled sweater. And then that other factor, I have to make sure I feel comfortable wearing it, and I'm just not sure. I think for me, the reason that I really wanna use this yarn is I think it's just something that is so special and so spectacular, and this is a dream project. I want it to be special, I want it to be spectacular, I want to have this forever and just love it so much. Um, so I'm also a little torn, and please give your opinion on this. I, I, I always love like reading what you think and it helps me like kind of get to where my brain needs to go, but I thought, the gray, the light gray looks really, really good. But I was like, I want something that's very me. So maybe I should do the pink. But um, I don't know, maybe I should do the gray because maybe the pink isn't quite bright enough. So your opinions, your opinions would be great. So anyway, I have started to think about this project. This is something I do plan on casting on in March. Um, if I don't end up using this yarn, I will be probably going more towards a, I think it was like a merino, um, I'm not exactly sure what ho he used. Okay, it did come out in January 19, 2019. Um, it just says any DK weight yarn, but I'm sure, I do have the pattern already purchased. I'm sure it says which yarn she used. Um, it definitely, oh, a merino cashmere nylon. So if I don't use this, I'll probably um, be exploring merino cashmere and nylon bases and that I feel pretty confident I will love <laughs> the way that it feels so I just need it's just a matter of color at that point um I think I think e even in talking through this I'm thinking that this is not the right yarn I'm not even sure it's worth to keep going just because of the feel um but I guess my other reason in swatching was to wash it and see how it felt after that so you know what, it does, it, I think I should keep going because I really think this would be such a spectacular sweater in this Tweety yarn. It's so cool, it's so unique. Okay, I'll figure it out, give me your opinion, but I'm gonna figure this out and I'll be back with more updates probably 
in a few podcasts from now because I don't really know what I'm doing quite yet. The one other thing I wanted to share is that before I even grabbed this yarn for the project, my first my first thing was like in my brain, I was just wondering what yarn to use for this sweater. I was kind of keeping an eye out when I went to Vogue. Instead of seeing something in the marketplace, I saw a lady wearing, I think it was a winter's beach cardigan, which is an Andrea Mowry pattern that has cables on it. She was wearing the light gray color of Tweety and I said, can I fill your sweater? And I thought it felt fine. And I, before I even went into like, okay, let me try that yarn, I went on to Ravelry. And I, I did a little screen recording here so you can see what this looks like. But I went to the All of the Lights pattern page. And then if you go over at the top to projects, you can search in the projects for specific yarns. So I typed in Tweety and that gave me, um, I think like five results, but only two of the pattern or two of the project pages actually used Hedgehog Fibers Tweety. And so I was able to look at theirs and don't they look so good in that light gray? I think they look amazing. I think it's like so fun in these cables and lace patterns. I think that was kind of the other thing that kind of sold me on it. Like, yeah, I gotta use this yarn. You know what though? It does seem like I really like the gray, doesn't it? But the pink is so fun. Okay, I got decisions to make, I got decisions to make. And we're gonna be here all day if I keep talking about these projects like this. So uh, let's move on to my very last thing. <laughs> okay, so the other project I am thinking about um, casting on in March is a scrappy project. So 2023 is my scrap free year and I'm really trying to use up all of my minis and leftovers in the first six months of the year um, just because I want to like clear them out and like leave myself space at the end of the year because that's when all the make-alongs happen. Everything is crazy. It's holidays. I can't be doing that then. <laughs> I need to do it now while there is time and space. So I finished my first scrappy project, my granny stripe blanket in January. Then I put together my granny square blanket in February. And this month I am moving on to something that is completely different. It is not um, something, a project that's already started. It is not technically scraps. It's actually going to be an advent set that I got in 2021. And that is this, my Fangirl Fibers Disney Advent 2021. It is so, so beautiful, these colors. Actually, I have a picture I can show you of this yarn laid out. So before I put it into the Ziploc bag, I took everything out of the packaging. This was actually Kent's idea. I took everything out of the packaging and I put it in order and I took a picture and I labeled like, here's one, here's 24, 25. And then I also kept all of the cards that went with it. So that way I could put it into a bag, which was much easier to store than the box I still had it in and all the little baggies and have it ready for my new project. So the project that I'm thinking about for this is a knitting project. All of my scrappy projects so far have been crochet and I'm really getting to the point where I feel like I need something different. Um, I need to kind of step away from the crochet blanket atmosphere do something different for a couple of months and then I have one more uh, crochet blanket I'm planning to make later on for my little buddy Toaster who's over here enjoying that scrappy blanket. <laughs> um, but I need to do something different and I'm, I'm really glad I already picked this for myself um, when I planned my scrappy projects was to like break things up with a knitting project, a longer term project. Um, I'm giving myself March and April to do this so I'm not really like too worried about getting it cast on right away. Although my original plan was to work on, I think one color every two days starting March 1st. So I'll probably cast this on over the weekend. Um, but the project I'm planning to make is called Delight by Laura Nelkin. You can see the picture of it here. It's basically a huge shawl blanket. It's like a, sh a schlanket kind of thing. And I wanted to pick something that would be really simple, really show off the yarns and also be a functional piece. Um, I just find that I'm not a total shawl wearer. Um, so I'm having a little bit of a second guess on this pattern. I need to kind of, you know, look at where I'm at now and what's interesting me now versus when I selected this back in January. Um, but something like this, I think is what I'm leaning towards. 
something that is a shawl like I, I just said I don't really wear shawls that much which is true but the reason that I was drawn to this one is that it's so large that it could also kind of act as like a blanket I think it would be really great for travel um, just to have that extra layer you can put around you you know around your arms you can put it in your lap however you want to actually use this it would also fold down really nicely because it's a, a thin yarn knit at a larger gauge um, so probably going to be working this pattern or maybe something very similar to it um, with all these really fun and wild colors I knew this wouldn't be something that would be a garment piece for me but would be something that would be an accessory so I again I'm not 100% sure on this one but hope to have some more solid plans to share with you next week okay this might be the actual longest project section ever recorded. So with that, let's move on to the next segment. We're just going to dive right into it because I know your tea is cold. <laughs> Maybe we should take an intermission. <laughs> get yourself some more beverage. Get yourself ready. Stretch for a second. Oh, it's a long episode but you got this. <laughs> okay, let's do questions. This first question today is from Cookie. I made my first muscle burrow hat and it's too short. Unfortunately, I already sewed the end and closed it. Do you think it'd be possible to cut that end off, add more length, and then knit the cut part back onto the hat? I'm thinking it's possible, but scared to try it without a bit of guidance as to if it would even be possible. Okay. I love questions like this because these are the kinds of questions you can't just Google an answer to. So I have my muscle burrow hat here to show as an example. So it sounds like you've completed the entire hat, but you want to add length overall. So first off, let me say yes. You can absolutely cut in the middle, add length, and then reattach the part that you have already finished so that you don't have to re-knit the decrease side. This is my decrease side, so that's why I'm going to refer to that one. So how would you do that? Well, first off, I would do it at least an inch away from your last decrease. So at least start down here, maybe even a little further. It honestly doesn't matter that much where exactly you do it because it's going to be quite seamless. If you are a little worried about how it may look, you might want to do it like kind of in the middle of your hat. Um, that way, well, would it be the middle? Wherever the middle is going to end up being, because then you will probably like fold up over it and you won't see it as much. So maybe that would be a better choice, but definitely nowhere close to the actual end of it. Because if you're stocking it all the way through, you can add length anywhere and it increases the overall length of the hat. Now, as far as how you do it, I actually have a video tutorial on how I did this on my Alpen Glow sweater. So this was a sweater I finished. It came out too short. Just like you, I had done the ribbing and the uh, tubular bind off, which takes a long time. I didn't want to redo that. And so instead, I went in above that, added, cut it, added more length, and then reattached it. And so I filmed myself doing this. And of course I put it in a podcast where it's really hard to find. <laughs> you know what, maybe this is one that I need to take and post separately um, because I do get asked for this one pretty often. So I'm gonna link that podcast episode for you along with the timestamp. Actually the timestamp for where to find the tutorial is in the description of that podcast. So I'm gonna link it for you down below, um, but you can go find it. I don't think I wrote down which podcast episode it is, but you're essentially going to take two needles you're going to figure out where you want to split things and you're going to pick up stitches with one needle all the way around your hat, then skip, I would say a row, and then pick up stitches with your other needle all the way around your hat so that you have uh, one needle with all of your live stitches and one needle with another set of live stitches that's going to wait and rest. That would be the part with the cap. Then you're gonna cut, you're gonna unravel a little bit, it's kind of like an afterthought heel if you've done that before. It's a very similar technique, except you're completely separating instead of just separating one half. And then you will join your yarn in, you will knit the length that you need, and then you'll take the little part that's, imagine this is separated, 
come back and you will do a kitchener stitch also called grafting and put everything back together it works really really nicely um, there's a couple of things you need to look out for that i include in that tutorial but it works great so i have one more thing for you to consider though doing that takes quite a lot of time um, not a ton of time i would say it's going to take you at least an hour to get everything separated so i would consider for this project specifically how long does it take you to knit this part? I'm going to say something like an hour and a half, maybe. Um, I, if it were me, I would not, even though you can, I would not take the time to cut in the middle and have to deal with all that fuss, all that extra mess, then having to graft it back together. I would do a kind of a time comparison. If it's going to take me an hour to separate, another probably half hour to then rejoin, but it's gonna take me an hour and a half to two hours to re-knit this crown, I'm just undoing the crown, right? Because a time to time comparison, plus like the new skills needed and like any errors that might happen or anything, it's kind of, kind of a difficult, not a difficult thing to do, but kind of like a risky thing to do, much, much safer to actually just pull back, knit to the length you need and re-knit the crown. It's really, not a lot of knitting when you compare it to how much time it takes to actually make that repair. There may be other factors playing in like your colors and everything that I don't know about. So make the best choice for you. But if it were me, if it was one color, all stockinette, I'm pulling back the crown and adding length and re-knitting the crown versus having to cut into my knitting. So take all of that information and make the best choice for you. Um, if you do need, I have actually one more tutorial in mind. Um, how to like rip back you'll kind of do something similar actually where you'll go around and you'll pick up all the stitches you need a um, couple rows below your last decrease or your first decrease rather and then you can just rip back and all your stitches will be on the needle so let me make myself a note to also include that tutorial which i think is called picking up stitches to rip back. See, I've got all these tutorials that I just need to make sure are easier to find. All right, let's move on to the next question. This one comes from Susan. Hi, you mentioned in your citrine light or your citrine sweater that you're making a size two with size three armholes. There are so many sweaters I would love to make, but I am very picky about my neckline. Is it easy to adapt patterns by using a smaller size neckline and then moving to a larger size for the shoulders and the body. What would you recommend to be the optimum number of sizes to go up or down? Thanks. Okay, so I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question because I haven't personally changed a neckline on a sweater myself, but I am gonna use some of the info I have been gleaning recently from all of, I've been taking a lot of modifying sweater patterns and like adapting patterns a lot of classes on that. And so there's something I've learned about recently that I think will be helpful. There is something, there's a measurement on your body um, called the upper bust. So most of us, when we think bust and when a designer gives us a bust measurement, they're probably talking about the full bust. So I have my measuring tape here, which of course is white. So it's not gonna be that easy to see on my white shirt, but you'll get the picture. Um, the full bust is like, right here um, at your fullest part of your bust. It may or may not be your nipple line. <laughs> Sorry, Kent. Um, I mean, we all have these, right? So that's not weird to say. Um, full bust, like basically, usually in the middle of your bust, but every body is different. That's the one that we think of. But for some of us, and not me, because I'm small chested, but for some people, we have quite a big difference between our full bust and our upper bust. And it might actually be better to pick a sweater um, that is geared towards our upper bust if we're having issues with the neckline. I can't remember which teacher taught me this, but we did learn this recently in one of my classes. So it's a good idea to try to take your upper and full bust measurements and just know, like, I think mine is like a three inch difference or a one inch difference, or, I mean a two inch difference, it's not that big of a difference, but for some people it's a huge difference. So the upper bust, and I know, especially people who sew, I know I'm not doing a great job with these measurements. You really need somebody else to measure you to get the most accurate, but bear with me here. So the upper bust is basically like right 
in your armpits, obviously above the topography. Um, and you can measure that. And you can see what that measurement is. And then if there's a large difference, more than a few inches, I would say it probably serve you to pick a size based on your upper bust because that's what's going on up here, right? If you have a six inch difference between upper and full bust, and then you pick a size based on the full bust, your neckline is going to be huge um, because it's really not how what's going on with the rest of you. Now, <laughs> after that, I don't know from there, like if you need to then add more increases to, you know, you know, get you to a good spot from here to here, and then maybe add a little bit for the bust. That I'm not sure, but I feel like if you start with the up, start with a size that matches your upper bust, and then try it on, you might be able to make a few modifications there. Could just look like doing one to two more increase rows if it's a raglan. Just be careful because everything you change affects other things like sleeves, etc. And knowing what I know now about sweater fit, um, uh, trying on your sweater blocked is going to be the best way to know if it is fitting you properly. Okay, hopefully that gave you some food for thought and I wish you the best of luck with your sweaters. It's always a journey um, and I'm always learning new things and I will always share with you things I'm learning and mistakes that I'm making so that you can learn from them too. Question three is from Atkinson. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I was trying to see if I was reading that right. Um, I know you've been knitting since high school, but when did you learn to crochet? What got you interested in crochet? And then there was also a video request here um, about Tunisian crochet um, and like showing myself learning Tunisian crochet. So I learned to knit when I was 14 years old from my grandmother and I learned to crochet not too long after when I was still in high school. I think I was 16 years old and I learned from a friend, um, my friend Jackie, who was a ballet dancer with me and also a crocheter. So she taught me to crochet. I very much did not like it because I learned to knit first. I, when I knit, I hold my yarn in my right hand. And when I crochet, I needed to hold the hook in my right hand because I'm right-handed. And I really had a hard time getting the tension right, holding yarn in my left hand. I eventually did get it, but it was a very frustrating journey. And so anyone who's trying to learn to do the opposite craft, like if you're a crocheter now and you're trying to knit, if you're a knitter now and you're trying to crochet, I understand how that feels. It feels very humbling to go back to being a beginner when you know you have mastery of one craft. Keep up with it though, because it's so worth it. Um, so I was in high school. I did not record, I think my early crochet projects. The very first thing I have on Ravelry for crochet that I have a, a finished thing, like my first true project where I followed a pattern, was a coaster. It is called the Shell Coaster. You can see a picture of it here, my first little um, project for crochet. Um, I remember being very, very proud of this because it's like lacy and all of that. And I didn't have anyone teaching me how to do it. It actually looks like it was a test crochet, which is wild that anyone trusted me to do that, but there you go. Um, and then a couple of years later is when I made my first crochet garment. I think I've said before that my tessellation tee, which I made last year, is my first crochet garment, but that's my first like very successful one that I feel great about and I actually wear. Um, I actually wore it last week, but this sweater, um, you can see here, it's the Lotus sweater. I know I knit it out of a magazine, like actually from the magazine. I remember looking at the tiny font in the column that it had to be in the magazine. This is like during Ravelry times, but not where less was on Ravelry. There was less like digital downloads and things. And so I remember I made this sweater. I was also very proud of it, by the way, um, that I did most of it. And then about a year later, I did the second sleeve and my gauge totally changed and it came out either bigger or smaller. I can't remember. And I kind of had to like rework, I think the first one I made, it was, it was kind of a mess. I did end up making this sweater again for my mom. She really, really liked it. So I made her a purple one. If I have a photo of that, I'll put that here. Um, oh gosh, what am I doing? Try to make notes for myself during while I'm talking, but 
doesn't always work out. <laughs> or I'll forget to put in a picture. Um, but I made my mom the same sweater and she really, really liked it. I think she still has it. I no longer have mine because I was wearing it and then I, it wasn't something that was part of my wardrobe anymore. But that's kind of my crochet journey. I do crochet a couple of things a year, I would say on average. It's not a huge part of my yarn world. I think I've done a lot more crocheting this year because of the scrappy element, finishing my blankets and things like that. Um, but I do like crocheting and I have Tunisian crocheted before. I actually made some washcloths. You can see them right here. <laughs> and um, I, I think I did that with a like a long needle instead of a or hook instead of one of the better hooks now that are like the short hook with the cord that's much more comfortable. So I didn't really, I can't really say I enjoyed it, but you're right, I do need to give Tunisian crochet another try at some point in the future. All right, the next question is from Christy. I love your channel. You're so engaging and informative. Thank you so much. My question is, do you have any plans for your magic knot ball? Thanks. Okay, here's my magic knot ball. I brought it over to show. Whenever I finish a scrappy project, because usually I've used the leftover for another project, right? It's got the original project, the leftover project, and there's still a little bit left. It goes in my magic knot ball because you can add anything from like a half a yard to a couple of grams and it goes on here. Um, so you just do a magic knot, which you can find tutorials for on YouTube. And I have been keeping it like this. I actually do have an interesting idea, I think, for my magic knot ball, but it involves writing a new pattern. So I'm not going to share that quite yet. Not because I think somebody will like take the idea, um, but because I don't want to make any promises about when it's coming out, knowing my track record with designing. So I'm going to keep that to be a bit of a mystery right now. <laughs> so since I didn't fully answer your question, let's add in one more. Um, We'll do six questions today. Um, this one is from To Knit or Not. That's a very cute name. Hi, Natalie. This question comes a bit after the fact, but I figured I'd pose it anyway. I love your scrappy granny blankets. I'm wondering how many rows you did on the striped one. I'm considering a temperature blanket out of granny stripes, but I have no clue whether 350 plus rows may be, might be way too big. Thank you, Marlise. I think is how you say it. Okay, so my blanket, I was going to show it to you, but somebody is on top of it. It's right over there. Basically, imagine this bed, queen size bed. That's how big my blanket is. It's pretty big. And I realized I didn't have the final totals of stripes, which are two rows, and rows on my project page. So I've since added them to it. So thank you for asking this question. So here is what I got for you. I did a total of 100. 34 stripes, two rows piece, which is 268 rows. For me, this gave me a queen size bed blanket where it's just fitting over the top of the mattress. It's not going over the sides. It's like exactly the length of a queen size mattress, which I think is like seven and a half feet, maybe a little more towards eight feet long. Um, the thing is, even if you're using the same hook size as me, which was a D hook and fingering weight yarn, which is what I did, you may not get the same results with the same number of rows just due to gauge differences. So I know, I know this feels like a lot, but the best thing will be to make a swatch. I actually did that when I started my blanket. I made a small swatch. I think I did like, uh, I don't know if it was 20 stitches or 20 clusters must not have been 20 clusters of, because it's like the double crochet clusters, but I did a swatch to measure my width actually, because I wanted to see how many stitches to cast on. And all that information is in the project page for this, um, which I will include. Um, project page. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that I need those things. But I would say use my numbers, 268 rows as a ballpark. I would say 350 is probably going to make a gigantic blanket, um, but definitely then measure your own things. I get what you're saying about a temperature blanket because you have a set number of days in the year, right? So you want to make sure like how many, wow, actually that's kind of a cool concept. It just kind of hit me that you said temperature blanket because if you did one stripe for every day, 
you could finish the whole blanket in a year and it would be huge. That's actually pretty cool. Um, but yeah, you might not want to do 350 rows. So I don't really know where you're going to want to go from there or, or you might want to make your blanket wider so that you can have like a massive blanket. <laughs> So those are some things con to consider. You won't be able to make a guess on this unless you have a swatch. Once you swatch and wash it, because you're probably going to wash your blanket, you'll know how many um, stitches will get you the width that you desire. You'll know how many rows you can handle. And for you, because you're doing something that requires daily like tracking, you probably want to see how big your blanket, how long your blanket's going to be first, and then set up a width that is going to complement that. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> okay, last question, because math is too much right now. Um, this question is from Jenny. I was watching an old episode yesterday, and you had mentioned you were thinking of rearranging some furniture in your bedroom, specifically moving your cube shelf to stand the tall way on the wall next to your bed. I'm just curious if you did try that and didn't like it. Okay, I always love when I get comments on past videos or comments that are like about past videos. Um, I know there's a lot of people that find the channel and then they watch current episodes, but then they also go back and watch past episodes, which first of all, just thank you for doing that. That's really, really nice. Um, so let me share with you what we, what, what came of that. So I'm in my bedroom right now, obviously. <laughs> Here's the bed. Um, and we were thinking about kind of rearranging things. So when we first moved into this apartment two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, um, I had my desk in the bedroom. Kent has his desk in the living room. We thought that was the best way to set it up. And it was at the time because it just gave us our own spaces. But what that started to do for me is I was spending my entire day here in the bedroom. I also had um, really struggled with work-life balance when we first moved here because I was just going into Nitty Natty full time after working outside of Nitty Natty and doing that. Anyway, that's something we don't need to get into, but I basically was having a really hard time. I was struggling um, with having my desk in the bedroom. There was like no separation. I also felt disconnected from Kent. We were, it was just not a good situation. And I just needed to make a change after about a year, I think, of having my desk in here. And so instead of moving my yarn shelf, because that was kind of the idea. It was like, I know you can't see the space right now, but I was going to have, I had my desk in one corner. I had my yarn shelf in another corner. And then there was this space here behind. So my thought was if I can move my yarn shelf here behind me, where the yarn shelf was, I could create a relaxing space, a space with a chair that I could sit and knit. I was doing a lot of like events at night for my membership. And so I would get up in here, I would work all day in here. And then at night I would come back in here and sit and do events. And I was just, I was going nuts. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't stand being in this room any longer. And so that was kind of the intention of, of creating a, a, another space in this room that didn't end up being necessary because we moved my desk from the bedroom into the living room. So now I spend most of my day in the living room. I can come in here if I need to get away. Kent can come in here if he needs to take a phone call. We're right next to each other. We work together more collaborative, collaboratively now. So that's actually really nice, but we don't face each other. We literally face the opposite ways. So we're not like totally in each other's space all day long, even though we're within three feet of each other. So that worked out great. And then we ended up bringing a chair in here anyway. Where my desk used to be is where the chair is now. So if we need a space to come and sit, we can do that. The one other factor is that this bed is an Ikea bed and it's two separate pieces. It's a base with drawers and then these like their little shelves on the side. And this headboard is bolted to the wall. <laughs> so when I told Kent I wanted to move the bed over just like six inches so I could put a shelf here, he was like, you know, it's bolted to the wall, right? He was like, we can do it, but it's going to be a lot of work. And that kind of, <laughs> that kind of put down that dream, but it all worked out because this bedroom is now basically just a space for me to record videos and for us to like actually use as a bedroom. It's not really a workspace anymore, which is fantastic. Okay. If you have any questions for me that came up or come up later during this episode, leave them down below, but make sure to follow this format. Put hashtag question very first in your comments. 
and then ask your question. That's how I look for the questions, how I know you have a question. It's very important that you do that and I will do my best to answer it in the next episode. So much has happened since I last podcasted as far as videos go on the channel and I have released uh, three more videos. So let's start chronologically and I'll put all of the links down below. So the first video last week was my big blanket vlog. So I started recording the day that I put all of my squares out on the bed, decided to order all the way to when I assembled the blanket washed the blanket, pulled it out with all the holes in it, fixed it. It's all together in one nice 30-ish minute vlog, I think. Um, so if you enjoy seeing like journeys like that, um, which I think it came together in like a really fun way, then go check out that video. And then last week, instead of a podcast, I put out a video all about preparing for a knitting retreat, um, but it was also a Q&A. So it was kind of a pack with me slash Q&A video all about knitting retreats and events. So even if you're not um, interested in the Knitting in the Hills retreat, there are lots of good tidbits in there about just going to retreats or conventions or whatever you like to call them um, in that video. So I asked for questions on Instagram. I got questions about like pricing. What about the food? Um, what about rooming with strangers and just all kinds of really good stuff that I feel like the answer is not a Googleable thing. I don't know if that's a word, um, but I wanted to answer all of the questions that I got and I think that I did so. And then of course there's the kind of casual um, pack and prepare with me element of that video too. So that one's a little longer. I think it's about an hour. So a good video to put on, you know, over the weekend and watch and learn more about retreats. The last new video is the Knitting in the Hills retreat vlog. So this one is just about the Knitting in the Hills retreat, which is where I was last week and why I couldn't do um, a podcast last week. It was so much fun. I'm not going to talk about the retreat too much um, because it's all in the video, <laughs> um, but it was a four day retreat in Austin, Texas, actually just outside of Austin, Texas in a a place called Lakeway at a resort and it is put on by the um, Hill Country, the store Hill Country Weavers, which is in Austin. It's a very well-known store. It's a great shop. Definitely go by and check it out if you're ever in Austin. Um, but the Knitting in the Hills retreat happens once a year in March usually. I think it's always been in March or like late February. I've gone three times, 2019, 2020, and 20. 23. So the vlog is just all about the retreat. This year I show like the whole retreat grounds. I show the marketplace. I even show the room, uh, of course, each day, my classes, um, stuff like that. So hopefully that one's a really fun one um, to watch. We just premiered that one today. So I got to like watch alongside everyone else, which is really, really great. So go give those three videos a watch if you haven't seen them yet. Um, coming up next week, we are going to be putting up a vlog all about our time in Austin before the retreat. So I we actually left on Monday, but from Monday to Wednesday, we were just hanging out in downtown Austin, basically eating. We went to four different yarn stores. All of those are going to be in that vlog. Um, so if you like yarn store tours, you're going to love this one because there's a lot of that stuff in there. Um, and other than that, it's pretty much food. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy getting to see those kinds of things. Um, travel, knitting, on my project, all of that. So that's going to be coming up this next week. And we'll be back to our regular Tuesday, um, like secondary video vlog kind of thing. And then Thursday podcasts. Hopefully I'll have all of my projects, you know, like more put together um, by then. Um, okay, so a couple of other announcements. The first is that the Perfect Fit Socks course is now open continuously. The sale is over. It is not at a, available at a discount right now, um, but it is open continuously. So if Perfect Fit Socks is something that you are interested in signing up for, you can go and grab that course at any time. 
get started right away. Um, you still have access to ask questions through the community um, or you can send me an email. I'm happy to help. I've been um, doing that with all of our current students. So um, if you have any questions, you can just email me about that one. Um, the new pricing plans are all on there. So you can choose to pay um, all at once over three months or over six months, I think are the three um, options that are there. There's another course that is not mine that I want to share because it actually is going to close enrollment on Friday, um, Friday like at midnight. So you have a couple days to sign up. And that is the Idea to Pattern Workshop by Megan Nodecker. Megan is a sweater pattern designer, a knitwear designer, and she has created this course for any type of knitting pattern designer, but it does um, include information on how to design sweaters. So she takes you, it's an eight week course, pre-recorded videos, um, similar to Perfect Fit Socks, but this one is more of a live interactive course. So you and all of the other participants will get videos once a week, and then you'll be able to work through those. And then at the end of the workshop, um, at the end of the eight weeks, there's a live Q and A session with Megan. You get to ask all your questions and stuff. And it's just a really good course. Um, I've gone through it as well, and it's definitely um, helping with the designing. Sorry, there's something like weird in my eye. All the all the light and the shadows are being crazy right now with the sun setting. Um, but it's a really great course. I couldn't recommend it more. Um, I will put a link down below. It is an affiliate link. Um, it doesn't cost you anything extra to use my affiliate link if you are interested in that workshop. But just remember that it is going to close on Friday at midnight. So it's only available for a short amount of time. Okay, Whew, so many uh, things to talk about. I am gonna share the winners too here in just a second. That's coming up here at the end of this segment. Okay, so something new that I am very excited to get involved in is an event that is a, a fundraiser um, and it is called the Knit for Food-a-thon. So this is something that I had kind of heard about last year, but I didn't really fully understand like what it was until this year. It is an event that is put on by Laura Nelkin, who is also a designer, a very well-established um, knitwear designer and some crochet pieces. Um, we just recently did an event with her in the Love and Stitches membership where she taught us to knit and crochet with beads, which was really cool. And she started the Knit for, Th knit for Food a thon a couple of years ago. I think this is the third year for Knit for Food. So here's how it works. It's kind of like those other athons where you're getting sponsored to raise money. Um, I need to pull up more of the information. I was just getting myself um, set up, but it looks like it benefits um, four different organizations, Feeding America, World Central Kitchen, No Kid Hungry, and Meals on Wheels. It's again a knit for food a thon. So it is um, knitters getting together and well individually in our houses <laughs> virtually um, and knitting for a long time on this one day and all throughout leading up raising money to then go to these four organizations and the date of the actual knit for foodathon is on sunday march 26th so it's coming up anyone can participate you just sign up online i'll put the link down below and you will be able to either raise money individually or i have put together a love and stitches team. So if you want to support the Love and Stitches team, which I'm going to be um, heading up and just like putting in under Love and Stitches, you can donate to that and then still come and participate on the day on that Sunday, I believe. So I need to like look into more details about it. I was just creating the Love and Stitches team here today. Um, but again, all of the money is going to go directly towards, it's going to be split into these four organizations. And then on Sunday, March 26th, I will be <laughs> knitting for, I think it's 12 hours. It's a 12 hour commitment. So um, there's a different events, virtual events throughout the day. Um, in the Love and Stitches membership, we're gonna have like an hour where we get on Zoom together. I'll probably maybe do something on Instagram as well. Um, and we're just gonna be marathon knitting, raising money to support these organizations, to um, help um, all of these organizations um, be able to supply food 
in the different areas where they do that. So I feel like I haven't gave, given it the best <laughs> explanation, but I'm gonna put all the info down below if you want to start your own, um, create your own team or space, or if you wanna donate into the Love and Stitches one, and then you can also participate on Sunday, March 26th of this year. So that's coming up. So that info will be down below. Okay, I think one more announcement and then we're gonna do the prizes. The Love and Stitches membership is going to be reopening for new members on April 4th. It's a Tuesday. I'm pretty sure I have that date right. Yes, Tuesday, April 4th. It'll be open for four days from April 4th to April 7th. So if you've been wanting to sign up for the Love and Stitches membership, if you've been hearing some of the different events that we do and you're like, oh, that sounds fun, um, there will be a, an email list that you can sign up on down below. And if you're on that email list, I start sending you information about a week early you get to come into a like a temporary Discord space. Discord is one of the spaces that we use in the membership all of the time. <laughs> so if you do sign up on that email list, you get a little more info about the membership ahead of time. You also get to come into that kind of like um, temporary space where we kind of start getting you set up for the membership. You're not committing to anything. That part's like completely free, but it just gives you an idea of like, here's what's actually going on in the membership. I typically will send you a recording from one of the events that we did in the quarter before. Um, so if you want like a sneak peek of that kind of thing, um, all of that just to like set you up and give you a really good understanding of the Love and Stitches membership. So all of the things I just talked about <laughs> will be down below. We'll probably have to create an actual like news segment for this one because there was a lot of things going on. Okay. Last thing here is our winners. Actually, I need to grab my bag of prizes. Real quick, let me just show the prizes one more time. I think I have these in the same configuration <laughs> that I had in the last video, but all of these came from Vogue Knitting Live. We got amazing swag there. Too many things for me to hold on to. So I'm using it as a prize giveaways. So the first is gonna be this Barocco sock, um, vintage sock, which was one of their new bases. If you wanna see the, them in more detail, cause you like them, I showed them all in the last podcast episode. Some size one and a half, like, like that needles and a needle gauge. That's the first one. I believe the second one was this prize. Actually, this is something that was not in our swag bag. Um, I won a table prize, which was pretty cool. Um, Lobby and May, along with like a little project card and some washi tape and this beautiful yarn from Monos. And then the last one is a, I think this was like a special color. We all got this one from Lobby and May. No, from Lobby and May? No, I'm making this up. I'm lying to you. Hold on. <laughs> I think my other yarn was from Lobby Anime. What is this from? This one is from, I don't really understand. Luis, Ro Ro Luis Robert Design. It's not just me, right? That's hard to read. Anyway, it's a really pretty yarn. Um, and it comes with two skeins and some, also some, uh, some Yucalan wash. Anyway, it's all really good stuff. It's just stuff that I, I can't hang on to all of these things. And so I wanted to use them as prizes. So I've picked out three winners using a random number generator. These are all completely random. And I, the way I did it <laughs> is I asked you to leave a video request. So you're gonna see when the winners pop up that it says video request. So you can of course tell me if you like this video request, if you wanna see it. Um, I just can't even tell you how much those video requests are going to help. So thank you so much to everyone who suggested something. Kent is working very, very hard to put all of your requests into a spreadsheet so that we can take a look and see which ones are like being asked the most that we wanna get started on right away. Um, so be looking out for some new videos in the future. Winner number one, and I'm gonna ask that you please email me 
I'll put my email here on the bottom of the screen. It's natalie at nittynetty.com. If you're a winner, please email me because if you don't, the only way I have to contact you is to reply to your comment. And that would be a little bit difficult for me to find. I didn't want to like spoil it and reply to you right away. Um, so now, yeah, if you can email me, please, <laughs> that would help out so much and I can get your address and get you your prize sent to you. If you're quick, you'll get to pick which one of these you want. Um, first. Okay. Winner number one is Tracy Parsons. Congratulations, Tracy. I would love to see more trips around New York and yarn shop tours. I have good news for you, Tracy, because in next week's Austin vlog, we go to four different yarn shops. It's not exactly the same as a full tour, I know, um, but you are going to get to see a few different Austin yarn shops there. So let me know everyone if you want to see more of our yarn shop tours, maybe interviews with yarn store owners. I think that could be really, really fun. I feel like I have a, a fuzz in my nose, so I apologize if, uh, if you're having to look at something there. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. <laughs> okay, winner number two is Renee Sparrow. A video request, um, stretches you do or workouts to help alleviate soreness from knitting for extended periods of time. Okay, if you wanna see a video like that, let me know. I know the perfect person I could collaborate with. If you haven't already um, seen the Knitting PT, PT, like physical therapist, Andrea is amazing. Follow her on Instagram. She is the best. She gives you so many amazing tips and she is a Certified physical therapist? That may not be the right way to say that. She is a physical therapist and she is fantastic. So maybe her and I could work together on something for all of you. Okay, last winner. This winner is Renee Philpot. I think we had two Renees. Um, congratulations, Renee. The video request was I loved your Stephen West MCAL compilation video. I would love to see more of these of other knit alongs or maybe a full project using an advent. It's so fun to see a project progress, um, project progress from start to finish, all the emotions and ups and downs along the way. As a newish knitter, it's not only inspirational, but also fascinating. Um, thanks, Natalie, for your amazing and consistent videos. Well, thank you so much. That's such a big compliment. Um, I also have good news for you because my most recent blanket video is a start to finish project. I guess technically I started it many years before that, but the actual assembly process is start to finish there. So I hope you enjoy that. And if you would like to see anyone, if you would like to see more videos where I go from day one to the end of a project, just let me know. I would be happy to do that. Maybe it would be fun to do a sweater like that because then I could kind of share with you all the things I'm learning about fit. <laughs> but instead of it being across like 18 podcast episodes, it could be all in one. <laughs> okay, congratulations to all of those winners. And again, thank you so much for all your video requests. They are not in vain. We are going through all of those and I can't wait to make more videos that I think you will love. So a lot has happened in the last two weeks, but for one whole week of it, I was actually filming two different vlogs. So the one you're gonna see next, the Austin vlog, is basically three, four days of my, my life <laughs> when we were on vacation in Austin. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too many details because you will get to see that in, in plenty of detail. And then the second half of the week um, is the Knitting in the Hills retreat, and you may have already seen that one, but if you haven't, um, you can go check out that retreat vlog down below. There was also another week in there where I pretty much was doing my normal life stuff. Um, not too much exciting stuff happened, except that um, we did, as the Love & Stitches membership, we had a class with Laura Nelkin and we learned to knit with beads. So I have a picture here of all my beading stuff like set up and ready to go. I was attempting to like bead along with the class, but I was also like paying attention to like the chat and talking with Laura and stuff. And so I didn't get very far on my beads, but it was really fun and it kind of awoken me that um, love for working with beads. I've done a few beaded projects over the years that I've been knitting and every time I'm like, 
I love doing this so much. I wish it applied in a more practical way. Um, but the mingle cuff, which there is a knit and a crochet version of the mingle cuff, um, is actually a pretty practical application of beads and a really good place to start. Um, Laura also has videos in the pattern. So if you get the pattern and you can even get a kit from her, which is what I did, um, you will have everything you need to get started with beads. It was a really, really great class. So I'm just going to kind of chronologically walk you through the last week, last yeah, the last week while we were away, because our videos are not coming out in chronological order. So I feel like it makes a little more sense if I explain it like this. So last Monday, um, Kent and I, we dropped Toaster off at his sitter, and then we flew to Austin, Texas. We had three days, Monday to Wednesday, that were not part of the retreat that we were going to. So our friends, Amy and Ian, who live in New Jersey, um, they flew down there with us and we just had a fun time in Austin. Um, we'll throw in a few pictures here, but we basically just ate a bunch. We got a lot of barbecue and a lot of Tex-Mex. We went to a bunch of different yarn stores. We went to actually four different yarn stores. I got to see my brother who lives in Austin and we just, hung out downtown. It was really fantastic and so much fun. So again, that's all going to be in the vlog next week. You'll see it in a lot more detail there. Then on Thursday morning, we checked out of our hotel in downtown Austin, drove about 45 minutes away to Lakeway, Texas. Actually, it was probably only like 30 minutes, I think. And we checked in to the hotel for the Knitting in the Hills retreat. We spent Thursday to Sunday there. We added one day on at the hotel because even though the retreat ended on Sunday morning, we kind of learned, especially with Rhinebeck this year, that it's really nice to have like one extra night where you're not rushing out. And so that last day, we literally, every, most people from the knitting retreat were gone. We laid by the pool. It was like 80 degrees. We sat by the fire and knit. We went to dinner with my brother again so I could see him one more time. And it was just awesome. And while we were at the retreat, <laughs> Kent and Amy's husband, Ian, um, I think they were kind of doing some work during the day, sleeping in and then um, going out, getting barbecue, getting Tex-Mex, getting other food and just having a good time. It was really a great, a great uh, trip, like all together, it was so much fun. Um, but by the time we got to Monday morning, we were ready to come back home and get back to Toaster. I miss him so much, I can't even tell you. Um, so we flew home on Monday, it was kind of an all day thing. Kent and I had um, two flights, we had a connect connecting flight, a layover? I don't know what the right way is to say that, but we flew from Austin into Kansas City and we were there for about hour and a half, I think. But oh my gosh, Kansas City has like the nicest airport. Um, as soon as we got off the plane, we were like, wow, this is really nice. Um, how to explain it? There's like huge windows like set up in just the right way where you can like see planes, planes taking off and landing. I feel like sometimes in an airport, you're like you're just not even facing like the runway. <laughs> you're just like somewhere else. Um, so that was really cool. There were like five different brewer breweries with, again, like stool set up so you could like watch planes take off and land, which was so cool. They had a super nice bathroom. I was extremely confused, I will say, because it didn't say all gender bathroom, but it was, um, but it didn't say that. So like you walk in and you're like, which side do I go to? There's no instructions. <laughs> so it was a little confusing, but it was a great bathroom. And I know this is ridiculous that I'm talking about the bathroom, but let me tell you, when you're traveling, you appreciate a good bathroom, right? So the things that were great about the bathroom, besides it being all gender, which makes it like no line, which is great. Um, the stalls were like floor to ceiling, closed, not open on the bottom. Love that. Um, there was tons of sinks for you to use. There were like, I think three um, diaper changing stations on each side. And these were outside of the like stall area. So they were accessible for like, 
men and women, so like all families could actually access these. They also had four family restrooms, like right at the front. So it was like four family restrooms, and then it split off into like individual stalls and changing tables. I didn't go in the family restroom, but I'm assuming there's changing tables in there. Um, so that's a big deal. And they were not just like little changing tables, they were really long counters. So if you had um, older children, maybe with disabilities that needed to be changed, I think you could do that in there. So big thumbs up, that was so cool. Um, and what else? I feel like there's one more thing about the bathroom. Maybe it was mostly the stalls. <laughs> I know I'm going on about this, but I didn't feel like I got to talk with anyone about it and say how much I appreciate it. So good job, Kansas City. Um, it was just a cool airport. And when I said on Instagram that I was flying through there, a couple people were like, how did you like our new airport? And then it clicked like, oh, this is brand new. Okay, what else did we do besides go to the bathroom at the Kansas City Airport? Um, then we flew um, into New York and picked up toaster and came home. And, and now it's pretty much today. So it's been, it's been a busy little bit of time. I'm definitely looking forward to some rest over this next weekend because even though we were technically away on vacation, we were working every single day, filming every single day, and of course having an amazing time. There were so many great things that we did, but it's also nice just to have a weekend where like you can just be a slob <laughs> and not put on any makeup and not film and just do whatever you want. So I'm excited for that this coming weekend. I finally finished a book. Um, I know it doesn't feel like a finally to you because it's been two weeks, but I was reading The Book of Two Ways by Jodi Pico. It was a great book. It was not a lighthearted book, very serious. Um, I think I talked about it a lot in the last episode, so I'm not gonna go too far into it, but it definitely had a little um, twist at the end that was actually pretty cool. So overall, I did enjoy the book, but I had a hard time getting into it at the beginning. It was confusing. And I don't know if I would totally recommend it just because it's a more serious book. Um, the content of the book, there's a lot of talk about death. Um, the main character is a death doula. So I needed a little palate cleanser after that. So once I finished The Book of Two Ways, still thought it was a really good book. I downloaded um, one of the Bridgerton like off um, series. Oh my gosh, if this spam doesn't stop calling me. I know I can put my phone where it doesn't ring if I don't have them in my contact list, but I've been needing to talk to people that I don't have in my contact list lately and it's driving me nuts. <laughs> um, okay. So I downloaded the Bridgerton's Happily Ever After, which is a short story collection. Um, this is by Julia Quinn. I've read all the other Bridgerton series. So good. I couldn't recommend them more. I love them so much. But this was a collection of all of the first and second epilogues from the first eight books, plus Violet's story. And Violet is the mother. So I had actually already read all of the first and second epilogues because when I read the books, all those were already released. I didn't read the books when they first came out. I don't know how many years ago. So I got to just skip to about 80% of the way through the book and read the last 20%. So that's all I did. I didn't really, I don't even know if it really counts as reading a book because there was only part of it that I hadn't read yet, but I did very much enjoy Violet's story. I wish it was longer. I wish it was a full book size because I'm really sad that I've read pretty much all that Julia Quinn has in the Bridgerton world. I think I still have like one more about the queen to read or something, but I'm sad. <laughs> Maybe I'll just read them all again. Um, so after that, I started the book I'm currently reading. It is called The Chemistry of Love by Soraya Wilson. I got this book last month, no, in January, I guess. Oh man, I guess I missed my February free book. If you don't know this, if you are an Amazon Prime member, you can get, I think like one Kindle book for free every month. It's like of a short list of books, but it's pretty nice. Um, so in January, there was a promotion, you got two books. So I downloaded, um, this was one of the books I downloaded, The Chemistry of Love. Um, it is a lighthearted read, which is exact, exactly what I was looking for. I will say it's not the greatest, like, <sighs> I hesitate to say this because it sounds very like elitist, book snob kind of thing. Um, but I've been reading a lot of books, so maybe I'm entitled to that a little bit. Um, but the writing is like, leaves a little bit to be desired. Um, and I 
before I, I know what you're thinking. It's a romance, Natalie. That's how it's going to be. But that's not true. You can write a romance and it can be very, um, like complex, um, and smart and like funny. Um, Bridgerton, I think does that really, really well. Of course I love Bridgerton, but so the writing is like a little bit not in the style that I was hoping for, but I'm reading it anyway because I'm enjoying the story and it's silly and it's ridiculous and the main character is a chemist which is why it's called the chemistry of love. She is kind of like a nerd. They say that in the book. I think being a nerd is a great thing. Um, she goes to you know Dungeons and Dragons. She loves Lord of the Rings. So it's kind of like a fun take on something that um, like on, on a romance and stuff. So I'm enjoying it so far. It's silly. Would I recommend you purchase the book? Probably not. But if you want to, if you see it at your library or whatever and want a lighthearted read, it's cute so far. And I will, I will um, come back when I have more information. I really haven't watched that much because we were out of town, but I did download a few things to watch on the plane. Um, I started watching season two of Firefly Lane on Netflix, which is really a good series. And then I tried but failed to watch Notting Hill on Netflix. And I was going to pull that up because I know some of you are going to be so sad that I don't know this off the top of my head, but um, Notting Hill is a movie that came out in 1999. It, is, it has Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant in it, um, which is so fun. I really like Julia Roberts, but I, I will tell you why I couldn't finish it. And I only got about 30 minutes in. It's so um, sad almost in a way how much movies have changed in the last like 24 years. I guess that would be 24 years. And the movie felt slow. And what, I, what that made me kind of think is like the movie was in the way Notting Hill was filmed was actually more like real life where there's pauses in conversations where there's awkward moments where it's not just like a action 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 and that's how movies are nowadays it's lots of cuts in in the scene like different angles of things that you're watching and that's what I've grown used to and so anything else feels like a drag <laughs> and that makes me sad I think I'm gonna have to go back and try to watch Notting Hill again when I'm maybe like, maybe I was feeling a little too energetic and I needed something a little choppier. Um, but I don't know, it made me feel like sad that I wasn't enjoying it because I know I actually do enjoy it. It's just like the pacing was so slow. Um, so would well, love your thoughts on that, trying to go back and watch um, movies from, I don't know, 20 years ago or more. And like just the different, the cinematic differences and like how we film stuff now and what we're used to now. It's just a different pace. And I don't know if that's always a good thing or not. Okay, I think that we're gonna end with intentions. I better switch my battery. I'm gonna try not to talk about this for too long, but I do need to wrap up February and tell you about my new goals for March. Every month I have a personal goal, a business goal, and a knitting goal. And by every month, I mean starting in 2023. <laughs> I am using this format and I am just gonna do it for as long as I have things that I'm wanting to work on. I feel like I'm the kind of person who always has something that I'm going to work on, but using this format where it's like personal, business, and knitting helps me actually have fewer things that I'm trying to improve in my life. And actually track those things and see if I'm doing them or not. Um, in February, there was something that I really didn't, wasn't successful on. And so I'm going to talk about how I feel about that and where I'm going from there. Um, so let's first wrap up February and then I'll share with you what I am planning to work on in March. Okay, so my personal goal for February was to try one new restaurant per week. Um, Kent and I did this together and it was extremely successful. We tried four new restaurants in our area. Um, we also ended up trying a bunch of new foods for us, which was amazing. So this last week in February was probably our least adventurous of all. Um, we went to a Mediterranean restaurant called Miriam. Um, just because it wasn't super adventurous for us, it was very good and I actually did still try a new to me food. Um, so we decided to just get a 
I think we got four appetizers so that we could share and try a bunch of different stuff. Um, so we got a kind of like a dip trio with um, a bread um, that we tried. It wasn't, I, I don't remember what it was called, the bread, but it was, it was really good. Um, I tried falafel for the first time. We also had these amazing like goat cheese, like crudite things that were so good. And Brussels sprouts, which like, come on, who doesn't love Brussels sprouts? If you don't love Brussels sprouts, don't tell me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but the Brussels sprouts were really, really good. Um, probably that and the goat cheese were my favorite. So it was a great restaurant. It was packed on a Wednesday night. I actually had a reservation. Um, so I feel like that's a good sign. On Like Wednesdays are usually... It, we picked Wednesday nights to try new restaurants because we noticed walking by restaurants that they really weren't very full and we thought not only would this be a good way for us to like be able to get into a restaurant easily but also to support businesses around us on a night where maybe they're not getting as many customers. Um, so it was cool to see a restaurant so busy. That was really nice. So. We had a great time doing that. Honestly, we're probably gonna have to do that again later on in the year because it was just too much fun. And something we were always telling ourselves, we're gonna try new places, we're gonna try new places. And then of course you get to a night where you like need to pick something up to eat and you just go to the same place. <laughs> so it was really good to get us thinking and actually going to new places. Okay, my business goal for the month of February was to design for one hour two times a week. I feel like I was successful in this in my first week only. Um, I really struggled with this all throughout February. I think you'll see that if you've been watching the podcast episodes. And I just was really having a roadblock with the pattern that I was working on. I kind of thought maybe it has something to do with like kind of getting over the hump of feeling that designing is so big and overwhelming. but. I kind of think I have a new theory on that and maybe why it didn't work out for me this month. And I think it's because of what I was trying to design. So I was working on these socks, which I put in a bag to bring with me on my trip to Austin and then literally never took out, literally never. Um, I hit a roadblock when I was about right here. It was all going well. And then I realized that you couldn't really see my stitch pattern. And then I tried some new things and I just was never really happy with it. Um, and I think that what I didn't consider as an option was to move on to another design. I thought like, I have to just keep working on this one design. And that was something that I really didn't want to do because it wasn't working out. And I think that's where I needed to kind of grow around that and like see that maybe Maybe I just need to like set this aside for a while, or maybe I just need to drop this one. Maybe this is just not going to work out the way I thought and that that is actually okay. <laughs> and so instead I was kind of stuck on that one pattern for the whole month and I wanted to just keep pushing through it and like not give up on it. And certainly that's a good thing to do in some cases, but I think with something creative like this, it just, for me at least, it brings out resistance to do it at all. The reason that I feel that way is that over the time that I was at the Knitting in the Hills retreat and I was around all these designers and like I was thinking about my own designs and things that I am really excited about and really want to work on. And I was like, wait, maybe I am excited about designing. Maybe I'm just not excited about the socks. And maybe that is okay. Okay, <laughs> so I share all that just to say like, even with goals, like goals are a guiding point, but sometimes you have to just set the goal to know that it maybe isn't the right one, or maybe you set the goal and you think the path is one way and you actually learn that it's not, but I don't think I would ever get there. I wouldn't have gotten there without setting that design goal for the month. I think I probably would have sat around in these socks for another couple of months. And then the things that I actually wanted to do for the spring would have then passed me by. I would have felt really guilty. So um, spoiler, I'm going to be picking design again for March. I'm going to approach it in a different way. And I'll share more about that in just a second. Okay, last thing for February was my um, yarn, yarny goal. And that was to 
um, put together five squares a day from my granny square blanket and ultimately finished the blanket in February. So I started crocheting together the blanket on February 3rd. I finished putting all the squares together on the 19th of February. And then on February, what was the date? It was a Sunday. No, it was a Saturday, February 25th. I finished the border, washed the blanket, broke all the squares, <laughs> not all of them, but broke some of the squares. And then I ended up officially finishing on Sunday, um, February 26th. So success. I'm so happy with the blanket. My relationship with it, I'm looking at it right now, is, is getting repaired as we speak. And I am feeling really, really good about accomplishing that goal. Okay, let's talk about March and then we're going to close up the longest podcast in the history of knitting podcasts. <laughs> Please still come back. They won't always be this long. Um, okay, so I have a brand new personal goal for March. So at the beginning of the year, it was actually when we were um, driving back to New York City from Nashville, where we spent Christmas with my family, I was writing down all these different things like that I wanted to work on for myself personal, like I wasn't categorizing them, I was just writing them down. And then I, you know, we always I think most of us get that feeling of like, wanting to make a change in the beginning of a year, or the beginning of a month or after something major happens in our life, whatever it is. Um, and we want to change, we want to do it all at once. And that's just not realistic for most people. It's not sustainable. And so I was like, let me just allow myself to write everything down. I actually put it in a note in my phone because we were in the car. <laughs> let me just allow myself to put it all out there. And then I can look at it and I can see like, what do I want to work on right now? And that's where I came to this idea of having um, three different areas each month where I'm working on one thing. And it seems to be going well over the first two months of the year. So we're going to continue it in March <laughs> and, and just, you know, every month I'll be kind of evaluating whether this is going to continue to work for me or not. So my March goal, I have a personal and a business and a, and a yarn goal for the month of March. So my personal goal is that I want to um, intentionally learn how to do my makeup. <laughs> I haven't fully fleshed out how this is going to work yet. I'm not really like assigning a time to it or anything. Um, but I have kind of always wanted, not always, but I've, I've kind of always just felt like I don't know how to do the girly girl things. And that's okay. Like, I don't need to do those things. I don't have to do those things. But the thing is, is that I want to be able to do my makeup. <laughs> so I want to be able to do that. And that's okay, too. Um, but it's felt very intimidating, especially with all of the brushes and the products and all of the things. Um, I don't want to take it too far. I don't want to like drastically change the way that I do things. I am a pretty simple person. I want a simple process. Um, but what I'd really like to do is kind of step up my um, base makeup. So like actually learn like, do I need a primer? Do I need to like, how do I put stuff like under my eyes and like cover up stuff? I don't know. Like, I don't want to look like um perfect or anything. I don't need to cover up every blemish on my face, but I'd like to do a little better or at least know how to do a little better on the days that I want to be on camera or go to an event. Like if, if I got invited to like a party right now like I don't even own eyeshadow <laughs> like I've gone that simple um so I want to learn kind of the base makeup stuff and then also how to do my eyeshadow um I currently don't wear any eyeshadow I don't know if I'm gonna like always wear eyeshadow every day or not this the point of this is to experiment and figure out something that works for me so I think starting this weekend I am going to start looking through a lot of YouTube tutorials and kind of find somebody who is doing their makeup the way that I am envisioning it for me, which is going to be pretty much on the simple side. Kind of like the person that you look at and like, it doesn't really look like they're wearing makeup, but they probably actually spent half an hour on everything <laughs> getting it right. I don't want it to take half an hour, but a little bit, a little bit more than I'm doing now. Um, so of course, if you have any suggestions for me, let me know. Um, I'm probably going to go from there and kind of set myself like a little budget and go off to um, get a few new products. 
so I'll keep you posted. Again, I don't really have like a an ultimate goal um, for this, but I think once I find something, I am just gonna like practice, practice on the weekends, practice, 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 and not get upset at myself for like not looking right <laughs> the first time, because I'm sure it's not gonna look right the first few times. Okay, my business goal for the month, again, is going to be design, but hear me out. I'm not gonna do it the same way as I did before, because that didn't work for me. Maybe it was mostly because of the socks, but maybe it was also because of my system. Um, scientifically, you probably shouldn't change everything about the way you're do some, doing something right away, right? It's like change one thing, see how it works, but I'm not a science experiment, so I'm changing everything. <laughs> I'm gonna change the way that I do it. Um, so I really want to do a yarn cozy make-along in the spring far enough away from sock week that everyone can participate and not feel like we're back to back on things. So I'm probably thinking maybe May or something. Um, but in order to do that, and, and you know what, actually I can already hear myself now. I feel like I need to add a bunch of new patterns to the yarn cozies to even have a make along. And that's not really true. We could have a yarn cozy make along tomorrow and use the patterns that I already have and that would be great. Um, but I really do wanna add things to the Yarn Cozy collection, different weights of yarn, different styles of things, different sizes of cozies. I have all these ideas and then I'm getting bogged down by socks that like really aren't as exciting to people, I think. <laughs> so um, this is what I'm planning to do. I have three weeks remaining in March because I'm gonna start this next week. And I have picked a goal for each week. Um, every Friday, I already sit down and I plan for the following week what things I'm going to work on and and what chunks of time they're that I think they're going to take and so rather than saying like I need to work on design for one hour twice a week I have picked a goal for each week and then when I do my planning I will decide how much time that specific task needs it may be more than an hour it may be less than an hour and I'm going to put it in so for um, the next three weeks, for week one, I am planning to just brainstorm all of my ideas for the cozies and then identify which order of priority they have. So all of the different ideas I have for like what size cozies, what weight of cozies, what style of cozies, I'm going to just write them all out freely, just let myself get them all out of my brain and then take a look and decide like what do I actually, um, what actually needs to come out next? What are people needing the most? I might even be asking on Instagram or something and like make a list in order for that. Um, my second week, I'm going to draft the pattern for the idea at the top of the list. We're gonna go one pattern at a time and then I'm going to plan out my testing timeline. I like to get all my patterns tested. So having those dates in um, gives me an idea of like, will this be out in time for my make along that I want to do. And then in the last week, I'm actually going to begin working on the pattern. So I have the elements there. I'm excited for this new plan and I'll let you know how it goes. Last thing is a knitting goal. Um, I thought about doing my Scrap Free 2023 project for this, but I'm finding that I really need something different, something that's maybe not a daily task because I've been doing that for two months, really three months, because in December I was doing daily stripes on my granny stripe blanket and I need something new. Like I need to do something different at least for a month. Um, and so my knitting goal this month is a really simple one. I just want to start the all of the lights cardigan. That is literally it. <laughs> it is a one time goal and I will be working towards it every single week, um, but that's the ultimate goal is by March 31st, I want to have started my All of the Lights cardigan. Um, so I did share this earlier, but just briefly again, here is the roadmap that we are using in the Love and Stitches membership for our dream project. So this is my dream project, and I am working right now to decide um, what yarn I want to use. And then over the next couple of weeks, I'll be swatching, and so that hopefully by the end of the month, I will have cast this pattern on and finally started something I've been wanting to make for like three, four 
years. Um, okay, so uh, that's all I'm going to talk about them right now because we'll get to talk a lot more about these intentions throughout the rest of March. I'm so excited for them. Um, they feel really good. Um, and if this um, type of goal planning like sounds good to you, give it a try. It doesn't hurt. You don't have to keep doing it if it's not working for you. All right, everyone. <laughs> If you stick around to the end, you truly are the best. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!